Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the next invited speaker, Dr. Mitsuo Kawato from Advanced Telecommunication Research, Kyoto, Japan. So Dr. Mitsuo Kawato received a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from the University of Tokyo in 1976 and obtained PhD degree in biophysical engineering from Osaka University in 1981. After that, he became a faculty member of Osaka University, and since 1988, he has been with ATR. In, 20, in 2010, he became the director of ATR Brain Information Communication Research Laboratories. He has led various big projects in, in Japan on computational neuroscience. For example, Kawato Dynamic Brain Project from 1996 to 2001, Computational Brain Project from 2004 and 2009, and Strategic Research Program for Brain Sciences from 2008. So Dr. Mitsuo Kawato received a number of research awards. So just to name a few, the International Neural Network Society Gabol Award in 2008, the Okawa Prize in 2009, and Purple Ribbon Medal from the Emperor of Japan in 2013. The title of his talk today is Diagnosis and Therapy of Psychiatric Disorders Based on Brain Dynamics. Okay, please join me to welcome Dr. Mitsuo Kawato. So thank you very much, Sugiyama Sensei, for a very generous uh, introduction. It's a great honor for me to be back to NIPS after 18 years break, and I would like to thank the organizers, uh, including Sugiyama Sensei, for inviting me uh, to this uh, most interesting uh, workshop. Only one thing which I miss from Brickenridge Day is snowboarding and skiing. Uh, this is a list of topics. Uh, I will talk about dynamical diseases, and then uh, I will talk about the necessity of causal tool for system neuroscience. And then uh, I'll explain about the coded neurofeedback, abbreviated as DECNEP and then control of conscious mind by DECNEP. Then I will discuss uh, possible mechanisms of DECNEP. And finally, I will talk about SRPBS, a project to apply DECNEP uh, for psychiatric treatments. So 1978 was a very important year for my life. I made a first abroad trip uh, to United States of America and for the first time met the late Professor Asa Winfrey, who was uh, one of the most creative persons whom I interacted with. And 1978 was the first year when I published a paper, and the title is Biological Oscillators Can Be Stopped, Topological Study of a Phase Response Curve, meaning that if you have type zero phase response curve, by manipulating the phase and the amplitude of the stimulus, you can stop any uh, biological rhythm. And it's related to Arthur Winfrey's uh, proposal that the heart sudden death uh, fibrillation could be chaotic dynamics. And Professor Leon Glass, located at McGill here, is another big proponent of this notion of dynamical disease. And finally, 1978 was the first and probably the last year when I pilot the airplane uh, without license. And as a Winfrey let me pilot this airplane and Professor Ryoji Suzuki, who was my supervisor at graduate school, was scared in the back seat. <laughs> And this is my definition of dynamical disease. Uh, dynamics could become pathological even without substance abnormality. The dynamical system might possess multiple stable and possibly chaotic attractors. And transition from a normal attractor to a pathological attractor initiates a disorder. And prolonged stay in the pathological attractor would lead to changes in substances 
that is leading to organic diseases. So spontaneous brain activity and intrinsic functional connectivity suggest that maybe psychiatric disorders are dynamic diseases. So now that nowadays many people agree that brain is not a mere input-output transformation system, but it's an autonomous dynamical system which can generate inherent spatial temporal patterns even at rest without any sensory inputs or invoking movements or without any cognitive tasks. So spontaneous brain activities contains evoked brain activities, and actually the evoked brain activities in the development constructs a spontaneous brain activity. In human fMRI, correlations of slow fMRI bold signals in the range of 0.03 Hz, that is 30 seconds periods, between brain regions define so-called intrinsic functional connectivity, or resting state functional connectivity, MRI. And this resting state functional connectivity predicted age of participants working memory capability, fluid intelligence, and recently even achieved individual authentication as listed in this uh, literature. And Weizmann Institute researchers many years ago have already found this in animals, actually in anesthetized cats, as they put uh, both age sensitive dye in the Broadman's areas 18, that is the second visual area. And although Jesus anesthetized cats, when the researchers show orientation gratings onto these cats, you can get this nice uh, orientation maps with pin field structure. But surprisingly, even for anesthetized cats and in total da darkness, you could see similar orientation map structure utilizing uh, self-organizing map uh, clustering of data. And actually, the state of this anesthetized cat seems to be slowly fluctuating, this is one second, uh, between different uh, brain states. And more recently, a Pfizer group uh, sticked 16 mounch electrode in the primary visual cortex of wake ferrets, actually at four young and old stages. And they recorded a multiple neural recording in three conditions, total darkness, no stimulus, uh, natural scene movies, and artificial uh, visual stimuli. And then they used uh, calbach libra divergence to measure the distance between uh, statistical distribution of these uh, many neural filings. And to make a long story short, they found out that the statistical distributions are all different between different conditions in young and only in adult and between spontaneous brain activity and the evoked activity by natural visual stimuli, you see similarity. So these authors uh, interpreted this invasion theory of vision uh, equalizing uh, the spontaneous brain activity as a prior distribution of the visual world. And posterior can be computed in a Bayesian way as a, con uh, as a conditional probability multiplied by the prior probability. And this finding is very nice and encouraging to people, old people like me, uh, who has already lost some vision in audition. So without good high uh, signal to noise ratio sensory stimuli, we old people have already trained this uh, internal forward model uh, prior likelihood of the external one. So I can correctly understand the video scene. But at the same time, many people here can remind faces of old people who are talking the same thing repeatedly, irrespective of what they hear or see. So in that case, they do not depend on this uh, conditional probability and too much depend on this uh, prior probability. That's a shame. <laughs> and in human fMRI imaging, uh, people found very similar uh, situations. 
So in the case of humans, we call it not spontaneous brain activity, but resting state uh, uh, activity. So resting state uh, functional networks uh, in spontaneous brain activity match well with those in 10,000 tasks. So this is a combined uh, task by Biswal et al. and Laird et al. And this is the uh, 20 independent components uh, taken from the listing state fMRI. And the main message is that 16 components out of 18 components uh, in the task corresponded well to those obtained from uh, resting states. So in a sense, resting state uh, networks already involve uh, task-induced evoked brain networks. So based on these, uh, our concepts of dynamic disease and the relationship between spontaneous brain activity and evoked or induced brain activities, uh, people uh, including me, uh, tend to regard psychiatric disorder as dynamical disease. Uh, because a small number of genes or transmitters or limited brain lesions fade to account for psychiatric disorders after decades of reductionist efforts. And recently abnormal functional connections were found specific to psychiatric disorders. So we might be able to develop biomarkers based on brain dynamics. And it is also known that normalization of pathological connections were correlated with the extent of improvements by different kinds of therapy, like pharmacological drug, or TMS, or electroconversion therapy, or uh, CDB, uh, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy. So with these assumptions, we formed Japanese SRPBS strategic research for promotion of brain science to develop effective biomarkers and neurofeedback therapy based on brain dynamics for psychiatric disorders uh, three years ago. So uh, this is a caricature. So nobody, including me, believes that brain dynamics is generated by gradient vector field. So this is just a caricature uh, for illustration. So in normal dynamics, you might have subtle uh, attractors uh, representing depression, normal, or schizophrenia. Even in the normal state, brain dynamics is always fluctuating like this. But because of some genetic reasons, some events in the development or environmental change maybe this normal attractor becomes weaker. And the depression uh, attractor could broaden its uh, attraction, of lesion of attraction. And then uh, this person might be promoted in career, or get divorced, or get ill, uh, for some uh, different reasons. Maybe the state uh, can close this uh, mountain and goes into the depressed state. And if it stays in the depressed state long enough, probably because of synaptic plasticity, mainly because of heavy synaptic plasticity, this attractor becomes stronger and stronger. So it's better to take, to bring this state point back to normal as soon as possible. Now, uh, I'd like to talk about the causal tool for system neuroscience. So uh, brain dynamics causes consciousness. Uh, this is a hypothesis which I like. And this is a very fundamental hypothesis, long standing and popular for most theorists, but not yet experimentally examined. As I have already said, Brain is not a mere input-output transformation system that could function as an autonomous dynamical system without sensory stimuli, movement, or cognitive tasks. Spontaneous brain activity is generated as special temporal patterns. And these special temporal patterns cause behaviors, learning, and consciousness. This is the assumption, which I would like to somehow experimentally uh, investigate. We combine two modern techniques of human system neuroscience. 
One is decoding of brain or mind or match box pattern analysis in fMRI. So Yukiyasu Kamitani, uh, who is a colleague at ATR, was one of the pioneers of this field. So the task is to decode or read out or extract information by looking into the activity. So this person is watching either this orientation or this orientation gratings. Uh, whether this person just looking into the primary visual cortex activity can tell uh, which stimulus uh, this person watches. Uh, yes, we can. Actually, most of the system neuroscience has been dealing with encoding problem. If we give some kind of stimuli, how our brain activity responds to this? This is an encoding issue. And decoding is the opposite direction computation. From brain activity, we would like to predict stimulus. And before uh, Yukiyasu Kamitani's 2004 paper, people saw that it's impossible because of the uh, spatial resolution. Uh, usually, we use 3 millimeter, 3 millimeter, 3 millimeter box cell in fMRI. And this single box cell contains probably several thousands of orientation columns. So we have so poor spatial resolution. But collecting thousands of box cells and apply machine learning algorithm at this time, support vector machine, you can decode uh, orientation. That was 2004 paper. After that, uh, Kamitani reconstructed arbitrary black and white images from primary visual cortex activity. And another Japanese colleague, Nishimoto, even reconstructed colorful uh, movie images from fMRI. And most recently, uh, Kamitani's group showed that dream contents can be led out by this technique uh, while a subject sleeps in fMRI scanner. And the other technique which we would like to use is traditional and region of interest-based fMRI real-time neurofeedback. This is not so much different from usual fMRI, but actually a subject is connected to his own brain activity by this feedback. So suppose that we define region of interest to anterior and dorsal cingulate cortex, this green uh, volume. Then its average activity is shown in real time to him as a function of time. And during this uh, gray period, uh, this participant is supposed to decrease the brain activity of cingulate cortex, green up, gray down, green up. And what good it is for. Actually, by suppressing anterior cingulate cortex activity, people find out chronic pain can be suppressed. And by increasing supplementary motor area activity, Parkinson's disease is somehow improved. And by going up and down for orbitofrontal cortex, uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, could be somehow limited. So this is nice. But this is controlling the average brain activity within LOI. It seems to me a little bit too crude. So we decided to combine these two techniques. So system neuroscience, especially human system neuroscience, needs a new causal tool. Uh, that is a method to induce a specific activity pattern in a limited region of a human brain. And the induced activity pattern should be decoded as a specified piece of information, such as orientation, color, preference, confidence, movements, images, and so on. And the induced activity causes uh, the conscious mind that corresponds to the decoded information. And this method should also be able to change the pathological brain dynamics of a psychiatric disorder into a normal dynamics. That is the main objective of our SRPBS project. Now, I am going to explain the decoded neurofeedback, abbreviated DECNAP, uh, which is a combination of this decoding and real-time fMRI neurofeedback. So this DECNAP 
has been already applied to therapy of OCD and chronic pain. And this method needs a decoder for each patient, and this application is currently limited to OCD and pain. Uh, in cases of high decoding performance, the success rate of the CNEF is 10 over 10, 100%. And sometimes we observe the long-term effects. So after, say, uh, four days of feedback training, we observe the long-term effect more than two months, three months, five months. But this long-term effect was observed only in two out of three cases. So the essence of this method is to compare the current spatial March boxer pattern with the desired uh, March boxer pattern corresponding to some specific piece of information. And the quota is used to measure the distance between these two uh, box cell patterns, and it was embedded into monetary reward, yen, and it is used as a feedback. So this is, in a sense, reinforcement learning. Just reward and penalty is uh, fed back to subject. No more detailed instruction to our subject. Or uh, if you are in the field of BMI, brain machine interface, you could call this as a version of neural operant conditioning, neural instrumental conditioning. So, so we expect these uh, participants can voluntarily control the spatial box cell pattern to the desired pattern, just guided by reward and penalty. How it is possible? Uh, I will explain that later. So the first objective of this study was asking about the low side of visual perceptual learning. In other words, our question is, are the primary and secondary visual cortices plastic enough to accommodate visual perceptual learning? There has been long-standing controversy about brain low side of perceptual learning. People like Dobsagi I propose that it's in V1, primary visual cortex. But other people said that it's in parietal cortex, MT, V3, V4, or even synaptic weights between parietal cortices and higher visual cortices. And one of the reasons why this controversy was not settled is that all the previous studies are correlational. So you stick electrodes into monkey subject, or you scan fMRI and ask your monkey human subject to do perceptual learning, and the behavior changed. And you try to find some neural correlates of this behavioral change. But this is just a correlational study. So maybe there's some brain lesion hidden from you, either by sticking electrode or by fMRI. That's a locus. And what you observe in fMRI is just an epiphenomena of the real uh, thing. So our goal is to cause some specific uh, spatial activity pattern in a specified brain area and to induce perceptual learning as a result. So cause and effect, causal neuroscience. And the experiment consisted of four stages, behavior pretest, fMRI decoder construction, decoded fMRI neurofeedback, and behavior post-test. And this uh, slide explains this behavior pretest and behavior post-test. The behavior uh, test is three orientation discrimination task. We show this 10 degrees, 70 degrees, and 130 degrees orientation gabo patch to our subject. Uh, our subject uh, watches this uh, fixation spot and uh, observes this orientation gratings for 0.3 second, and then needs to uh, report the orientation uh, perceived. We change the signal to noise ratio by adding noise. So it should be quite difficult to see 70 degrees orientation for this. So we can draw sigmoid function, uh, psychometric curves or psychophysics curves uh, in this uh, pretest and post-test. And by comparing these uh, psychometric functions, uh, we can quantitatively estimate uh, about the amount of visual perceptual learning. So in usual 
uh, visual perceptual learning behavioral tasks, we usually show this kind of very faint uh, stimuli uh, repeatedly to the subject. Then, even by repeated exposure, uh, people tend to increase their dis discrimination performance. But in this experiment, we did not show any visual stimuli during these training periods. We first uh, constructed a decoder by our fMRI match box pattern. So this decoder is based on marginomial sparse logistic regression, which I will explain in the next slides. And the task of this decoder is to compute the likelihood uh, of the three uh, orientation uh, is presented to this brain, to this participant. Uh, for example, it can say the probability of 10 degrees orientation, 61%. 70 degrees, 21%, 130 degrees, 18%. Uh, we used uh, sparse logistic regression uh, developed by Okito Yamashita, and this is nice because it does not need to tune any hyperparameters in algorithms. And it is a simple linear summation for each class and then softmax function. Uh, he put ARD uh, sparseness prior to this. So basically, in primary visual cortex and secondary visual cortex, we have several thousands of boxes. But we could get uh, at most uh, 400 learning samples. So sparseness is really uh, necessary. Uh, usually, this uh, uh, marginomial sparse logistic regression are selected only 200 boxes out of several thousand to ensure good generalization of uh, subless overfitting. And now, this is the most important and probably most difficult to understand conceptually. So above this broken line, a subject participant task is explained. So we ask our subject, please manipulate your hind brain to get maximum monetary reward. That's all what we said to our participants. So it's really reinforcement learning. We did not give any verbal instruction how to manipulate their brain. But I informed to our participants, we calculated the likelihood of the target orientation allocated to each uh, participant. For example, for this participant brain, we allocated 10 degrees as a target orientation. And if uh, this decoder computes a likelihood is 61%, then uh, the maximum monetary reward per trial is 15 yen, around 15 cents. And 15 yen multiplied by 0 0.61 almost uh, equals 9 yen. So this participant earned 9 yen in addition to the basic uh, honoraria. But uh, you may wonder, we didn't present them any uh, orientation gratings. Why this brain activity pattern could become similar to the that induced by 10 degrees orientation? Now you need to recall this study by Weizmann Institute. Even in the spontaneous brain activity resting state, your brain activity fluctuates and sometimes looks like uh, the evoked brain activity by some specific orientation. So without visual stimulus presentation, the brain state fluctuates and this fluctuation was detected by our decoder. And if the decoder says uh, this brain, spontaneous brain activity is close to the desired brain activity, then we gave uh, much monetary reward. And if this is so different from this and likelihood is 0%, then we did not give them any monetary reward in this trial. So each participant did 180 trials in a day. And because we saw this is really a high dimensional cost of dimensionality reinforcement learning task, we set 10 days of training. But we are perfectly wrong our subjects were smart enough to get uh, statistically uh, 
higher than chance level performance on the first day. This was an enigma for us until my good friend Kenji Doya told why uh, this was achieved. Anyway, uh, for 10 days, uh, the mean likelihood for each orientation, for the target orientation, was statistically significantly higher than the chance level, 33.3%, 100% divided by three. And every day, they seem to be better in inducing the target orientation brain activity. So new feedback went well, but did it affect uh, perceptual learning in any way? <coughs> yes, we had this uh, nice uh, result for comparing uh, pre-test and post-test uh, psychometric curves for non-target orientations, minus 60 degree, plus 60 degree, we didn't see any difference. But for the target orientation, we observed quite large uh, effect, 20% improvement for the same signal to noise ratio. So accuracies only in target orientation improved in post-test compared with pre-test. So conclusions of perceptual learning induced by decoded neural feedback are as follows. Mere induction of spatial pattern of neural activity is sufficient to cause visual perceptual learning without visual stimulus presentation. Bouillon V2 are locus of visual perceptual learning demonstrating Bouillon V2 plasticity in adulthood. And most interestingly, subjects were not aware of what the neural feedback signal represents and which is a target orientation. So after all the experiments were completed, we asked about the strategies for each subject. And they reported really superstitious uh, strategies, like I just uh, focused my attention on the fixation spot. I imagined about a large monetary reward. I switched my attention to right eye and left eye. And the funniest report is I imagine uh, my most favorite scene from my uh, most favorite manga, anime. And no report has nothing to do with orientation or gratings at all. And then we told them the mechanism of uh, the new feedback experiment and asked them, please guess in which orientation you were trained or what was the target orientation for you. Again, uh, their report was total London. 33% for each orientation. So neither implicitly or explicitly they were aware of what they did. And we also ascertained that there was minimal information leak outside V1, V2, like V4, V3, other brain areas. So this manipulation of information was limited in V1, V2. So uh, we then tried to extend this to control of conscious mind. First, uh, we did the manipulation of facial preference. So uh, the experimental procedure is very similar to the previous one. Uh, in the psychophysical pretest and psychophysical post-test, we show 400 uh, face images and ask our subject to rate uh, their preference from one to 10. 10 most preferable, one least preferable. And then we used a sparse linear regression. This is a regression version of the sparse uh, estimation. And this uh, sparse li linear regression decoder most uh, uh, accurately predicted the preference from the singulate cortex, entire singulate cortex. And new feedback experiment is very similar to the previous one, but we showed uh, a neutral phase for 0.5 seconds. Then we asked to get maximum monetary reward, and in this case, uh, this monetary reward is uh, directly proportional to the estimated preference from the singulate cortex in the case of increasing preference. But in decreasing preference, we subtracted the output from this decoder uh, from 11 to invert the sign, then we can decrease the preference. Again, induction was successful. For up group, we had uh, 
larger preference or down group, we had the decrease preference. This is induction phase. <coughs> and we could see a preference rating change in comparing pre-test and post-test. For up group, we had increase of preference, and down group, decrease of preference. And most beautifully for me is if you plot the induced activity change in the neurofeedback training period as abscess, which should be a cause, and plot the preference leading change measured in behavior as ordinate, which should be the result, cause and effect. Then the linear fit was this, which almost passes the origin, zero, zero, and the slope was almost one, saying that cause and effect match very well. And each point is each participant. <coughs> so conclusions of facial preference manipulation is as follows. Associative DECNEF can bidirectionally change facial preference without conscious awareness. And the cingulate cortex is a central area encoding both like and dislike of facial preference by different March boxer activity patterns. Actually, it was not demonstrated in fMRI literature that the single brain area, by changing its uh, spatial activity pattern, encode both uh, preference and uh, non-preference for uh, things like uh, face. So we found out that DECNEF works also for higher cognitive functions and in the frontal cortex. So <coughs> uh, we attempted to apply DECNEF to psychiatric disorders like OCD, PTSD, and pain. The next study is also DECNEF application to extinction of fear memory, and which is related to PTSD therapy. I, Koizumi, Amano Kaolu, Alirio Kotes, Wako Yoshida, Ben Seymour, and Hakuan Lao uh, courses on this. And experimental procedures is again very similar. On the first day, we constructed a color decoder. So this decoder uh, takes uh, much boxer patterns from V1, V2, and discriminate, <coughs> excuse me, uh, red vertical gratings versus green vertical gratings. And on day one, uh, we did fear conditioning. So for this target, CS plus, red gratings, we gave electrical shock. Uh, for control CS plus, green vertical uh, gratings, we gave electrical shock again. And for this yellow vertical grating, we didn't do anything. So these two are target CS plus and control CS plus, and this is CS minus. So we expect our subject to increase amygdala activity and to increase skin conductance reflex only by showing these uh, conditioned stimulus, positive conditioned stimulus, CS plus. And then we try to extinguish, eliminate fear memory related to this red grating by repeatedly inducing red color by DECNEF in Buyan V2 while physically presenting achromatic vertical grating. So this is a kind of association. By physical presentation, we show vertical gratings. By DECNEF, we induce color information in V1, V2 and associate these two. So this is kind of similar to so-called uh, exposure therapy. So if you have PTSD because of tsunami, earthquake, even if you see uh, pictures or videos of tsunami and earthquake, uh, your fear memory is recalled. So one uh, therapy is to repeatedly show Gs until you do not feel any fear. But that's, of course, very, very stressful. Uh, with this DECNA, we can subconsciously present uh, target CS plus repeatedly without uh, hassle by our patients. And then we examine uh, amygdala activity and skin conductance reflex on day five. Oh, 
we uh, trained our subject for three days, days two, three, four. And then day 113 plus, we examined the long-term effect. And the result was rather remarkable. So before DECNAF, our conditioning went well. So for 2CS plus, we had larger amygdala signal change compared with CS minus. But one day after DECNAF, the amygdala activity was dramatically suppressed only for CS plus. And even four months after that, we had this decrease. And skin conductance reflex was even more robustly suppressed compared with this amygdala activity. Oh, by the way, amygdala was uh, anatomically defined uh, for these analysis. Now, the final one for DECNEF. So we used March box and neurofeedback DECNEF to selectively manipulate a subjective awareness without changing perceptual performance. So this was just submitted yesterday. Um, behavioral task was two alternative false choice discrimination and perceptual confidence rating. So we ask our subject to fixate, then we show purely random uh, dot motion, pure noise. Then we show either right word or left word partially coherent lambda dot motion with a coherence level of a threshold, 75% correct. Then we ask our subject uh, to guess whether the motion is right or left, and also asked they have confidence about this uh, perceptual judgment from one, two, three, four. One is least confident and four is most confident. So confidence is uh, defined as degree of certainty of uh, perceptual decision in this experiment. And confidence is a hot topic as metacognition and self-awareness. The coding window used was here a three TR, six seconds, including this stimulus and delay before response. Uh, we found out that uh, those lateral prefrontal cortex containing IFS, MFS, MFG, and uh, infraparietal lesion are the most uh, informative brain lesions for decoding uh, this uh, confidence. So, uh, Inducing a target confidence state without awareness of what has, to be, what has to be learned was carried out very similar to the previous three experiment. We asked our subject, somehow manipulate your brain, I will give you monetary feedback. And this monetary feedback was defined uh, by the decoder, uh, which uh, predicts the preference. And in this case, we did both increase and decrease within a single subject, uh, two days uh, for each week uh, and continuous two weeks. And correlation between induced brain activity patterns and uh, confidence change were nice again. And perceptual confidence was manipulated bidirectionally without perceptual performance change. And the result eludes a popular theory assuming confidence was just unaltered, non-linearly transformed version of perceptual signals. That cannot explain this result. So this is a list of successful DECNF experiments. I explained these four, and phenomenal consciousness, treatment of chronic pain, OCD exposure therapy, stroke patients, and also other labs uh, uses very similar method for controlling attention. And what is a possible mechanism of DECNF is uh, uh, next topic. So this is just speculation, but uh, we have several uh, data supporting this. So DECNEF works as reinforcement learning of brain activity pattern guided with beza ganglia activation. And brain activity always fluctuates. Uh, if activity happens to fluctuate in the desired direction, the decoder detects it, and the reward feedback is given to a subject on the brain. And synaptic plasticity is induced dependent on NMDA receptors, dopamine, and serotonin. My colleague in SRPBS, Professor Yuji Kegaya at Tokyo University, uh, implemented a similar experimental paralyze to DECNEF in mice. And uh, he can pharmacologically manipulate a mice brain and find out uh, that NMDA receptor, dopamine, and serotonin are all essential. 
And then uh, we have several computational remarks uh, for the first one, thanks to Kenji Doya. So we first saw that this is a cost of demand generality problem because we have at least 200 boxes, many degrees of freedom, and we gave just reward and penalty. So it should be impossible for a subject to, to figure out how to control this brain activity pattern. But Kenji pointed out that because we use a monotonically increasing function, logistic function, and linear weighted summation in decoder, there should not exist cost of dimensionality in reinforcement learning, almost like uh, supervised learning or stochastic gradient descent. If each box cell behaves like a single neuron, we can apply simple heavy learning to make this uh, reinforcement learning possible. And then another big question, we did only box cell level control. Why it can lead to neuron and synaptic control? Uh, because we can manipulate many things. It should influence synapses and neurons. And that's because I believe constraints of brain dynamics and spontaneous brain activity. Uh, we have infinitely possible brain state if there is no connection. But because of spontaneous brain activity are constrained by internal connections, it is very well aligned with the evoked stimuli. And this is a diagram from Ken Harris. And uh, with some uh, analysis, MDS and the similarity analysis, we found out that our induced brain activity are similar to those uh, brain activity induced by the target orientation. So this does not use our decoder, but still we can see similarity in March box cell patterns. And SRPBS uh, DECNEC project has been working quite well, and we now uh, collected 1,100 uh, participants, uh, including depression, schizophrenia, chronic pain, OCD, ASD, and back pain. And we use DECNEF for OCD and pain and functional connectivity neurofeedback for ASD, depression, schizophrenia. And uh, connectivity neurofeedback is to feedback functional connectivity between uh, two brain lesions to subject. So, I do not have time to explain about our uh, biomarker project, but utilizing uh, nested feature selection by L1 SCCA and one leave out cross validation by SLR, we could uh, construct a very reliable uh, biomarker of ASD uh, based on RSFC MRI. Then we found out that the connection between the right amygdala and the left nucleus accumbens is existent and positive for typically developed controls, but virtually it does not exist uh, for ASD patients. And it matches well with the notion that ASD is social motivation theory. And, but anyway, uh, we've been trying to increase this non-existent brain connectivity to the positive direction. So a summary of DECNEF and uh, functional connectivity NEF in SRPBS, decoded new feedback and functional connectivity, new feedback and non-invasive causal methods to alter uh, human brain dynamics and resulting behavior and consciousness. And biomarkers for SD, depression, schizophrenia, and OCD exhibit the spectrum relationship in resting state functional connectivity MRI. DECNEF are effective for phantom pain. In this case, 15 patients were examined with nice control and VAS improved. And in the OCD case, one patient with white box. And FCNF are effective for SD, 10 patients, and depression, 60 healthy. And the BDI, Beckman, depression, inventory improved. So concluding remarks, uh, psychiatric disorders could be better understood as dynamical disease. And DECNEF and the functional connectivity in your feedback are causal tools in human system neuroscience. March biomarkers based on brain dynamics revealed spectrum of psychiatric disorders. The biomarkers of each disorder was used in determining target functional connections in functional connectivity neurofeedback therapy. And DECNEF and functional connectivity neurofeedback could constitute next generation therapeutic treatments and already provided preliminary but encouraging results. I did not have uh, much time to explain about 
function connectivity in your feedback and spectrum of psychiatric disorders. I'll talk about it on Friday, the day after tomorrow, from 2.30, in machine learning and interpretation of neuroimaging workshop with a title spectrum of psychiatric disorders revealed by machine learning algorithms. So I'd like to end uh, with uh, imaginary uh, figure showing uh, spectrum structure of many disorders. This is an imaginary picture, so please do not believe in this. And it is my midterm goal to locate myself by the resting state functional connectivity where I am located. My guess is uh, around here, I think. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Question? Yes, please. Hello, thank you for your uh, very nice presentation. Um, there's something I didn't uh, quite understand uh, when you talked about uh, leakage of uh, information uh, uh, where you had a decoder on V1, V2. Yes. And I, I thought you meant that maybe uh, the signal about the, uh, the correct target was not present in the other areas. Is that what you meant? Yes, exactly. But what? then how does the information go to the motor cortex so that you, the, the person actually does the action? It well, has to go from V1, V2 to the motor cortex at some point. So right? actually, this is not a usual brain machine interface like experiment. So subject does not need to utilize this orientation information in that trial at all. Oh. Oh, our decoder leaves out this orientation information right. and just gives you know, monetary uh, feedback, uh, penalty or reward. And regarding the technology, uh, we use trial to trial decoder of the V1, V2 likelihood by March boxer patterns of other brain areas. So what about dopamine uh, neurons? I mean, they would be predicting the reward, presumably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're right. Somehow, this information should go to probably dopamine neurons and serotonin neurons. But uh, I'd say, uh, with a uh, March box cell uh, machine learning algorithm, we cannot detect that kind of uh, information leak to dopamine or serotonin neurons. But anyway, we didn't use midbrain as a target region for this leak analysis. Thanks. Thank One you. more quick question. Uh, hello. So it was a really great talk. And I, I was wondering whether you have any idea of how information arrives to control low-level visual areas. You were suggesting some strategy using high-level uh, representation of images like uh, imaging my favorite scene. So, and then do you think something like backprop from, from that can happen to... Mo to so, mo I'm control? not sure whether I really understand your question. Do you ask uh, whether we give a uh, you know, useful uh, linguistic strategy or conscious uh, instruction to our participants? No, 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 I know the neurofeedback works, so I know that you don't do it, and yeah. you let them look for a strategy, right? And now, while you were explaining one of the narrative of the strategies, yes. one of the subjects, if I remember well, say that he was imaging a natural scene, mm -hmm. right? And using the natural scene, which we all here think of being constructed by a layer of feature maps, to modulate one of the lowest level of the feature map, right? To modulate v, the v, the V1 or V2, what, uh, what, what was your target? So do you think that, like, actually human subject can have access to modulate their uh, late ventral stream areas and use this to backpropagate activity to early, early visual areas and this way they achieve control or whether and there are uh, multiple yeah. paths that you can use for, to do so this? I still do not uh, know whether I really understand you, but if you are talking about some kind of downstream influence, for example, from uh, prefrontal cortex or parietal cortex, maybe we have downstream uh, control of the March box patterns in the primary and secondary visual cortex. We believe it does not exist in this kind of experiment because uh, we did some other experiment which we are interested in phenomenal consciousness, so which is not above consciousness, but only when you have attention or top-down control, this uh, uh, content of information uh, appears 
on the surface. So in that case, we found out that uh, just manipulating V1, V2 does not reach to the usual uh, sense of consciousness. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Mitsuo again.